Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sample. Uh, while my Nest team peers are focused on the nitty-gritties of automation, I'm going to focus it on the strategy and application of automation in our daily lives. So first things first, right? So we're used to doing a few things in a few ways because that's the way we have been taught. That's what we have seen so far. So look at the stories that we read to our children, right? We see, you know, Tarzan lives half naked, perfectly fine amidst the apes. You know, Cinderella comes home back at midnight and her parents don't say anything, right? Aladdin lives with 40 thieves and it's perfectly okay, right? And the last one that really bothers me a lot because I've been reading it to my daughter all along, you know, Snow White lives with seven guys and then she turns 18 next year and she's going to college. So this keeps, you know, me up in the nights, you know, saying, why did I even read it to my daughter, right? Now applying this to real life and then how we do you know, automation, how we do quality engineering, there are certain things for us to end respect. Right? We've been doing a few things, but things have changed quite a bit. Uh, so it'll be, you know, very good to see. So I'm going to talk about four behaviors that, you know, we follow. And uh, that's changing very drastically. And how are we going to, you know, cope up with that? How are we going to apply automation to it? And how is it going to, you know, resolve uh, what we want to do with customer experience, right? So if we look at the characteristics of the modern applications of today, right? You see they're no longer siloed applications. They are super duper integrated. You know, they're completely modularized thanks to microservices, right? The end users are digital born. So the span of attention is super low. And if there is an security issue, it's no longer you know, forgiven you, you would get divorced immediately, right? And you know, the, the company that rolls out features faster to the market, you know, adopt uh, and then capitalize on the market share the most. And then testing in production is becoming absolutely the norm in order to deal with, right? So now the applications have become modern, the technologies are modern, are our automation principles and our you know, approach to doing quality engineering model. That's something that we have to look at, right? The first thing, and if you look at it, uh, let me manualize this. So if you look at it, you know, um, the biggest problem of agile is big picture thinking, right? All the developers are focused on user stories, they are very keen on looking at it and making sure it goes fine. As a quality engineer, if we do the same, it's a very big issue. If we don't have a view of the big picture and why we are here to do, uh, and then we purely you know, focus on the acceptance criteria and done definitions, then I think we have failed to start with, right? The five whys, you know, why are we building this feature? Why am I testing? Why am I automating this? What is the quality? Why is quality so important? And why do my customers need this? That's something that we absolutely miss, right? So the customer journey mapping, right? If I can, you know, uh, tie a business problem and then, you know, back to the technology of automation in here. If all our user journeys are emanating from the home page. Right? And we are seeing how many clicks and how is this happening. And certainly marketing runs a promotion and 70% of the traffic is diverted to the promotion page from which they're traversing the different functionalities. And you know, you're not reflecting it in your automated suites. That is a very big problem, especially you know, in the era where you, know, you have access to production monitoring you know, systems. You have, you have access to the likes of you know, Tea Leaf, Dynatrace, you know, all the APM tools and their Splunk logs, and you can see exactly the journey that the customer is taking to. You know, that's something that, that as an information, if you're not leveraging in an automatic way, I think that's a criminal waste of your time, right? Now, you really have to look at what is the journey that's most adopted, where's the traffic, 
you know, what's the most used path, there is a, a defect in a tolerance level, but not in the critical paths. And if that's not reflected in your suites, then that's a big issue. So what we recommend is, you know, we look at these events pretty close to, you know, real time, and we compare it with the user journeys that's being covered by test suites. And this AI that's getting built in into the test design automation, which says, you know, your suites cover page one, two, three, and five, but most of the action is happening in four and six, uh, in addition to a little bit in one and two, then the AI engine will have to come back and tell you that this is the coverage and you're missing on this particular coverage and the closest suite to that is, you know, X, Y, and Z. Here is what it is that you need to build, con you know, continuously into your automation suite. You've got to change the flow. And then, you know, your automation engineers, your, you know, functional engineers, they get together, they update whatever is, you know, uh, to be done in the remaining part of it. But a lot of it needs to happen very, very dynamically. So tying the customer journey to the suite is absolutely important. That's something that over 70% of the quality engineering teams are missing today. They're testing it by the features, which they think is their Bible, the customer journey and what the customer actually wants and what they want dynamically. And being able to prevent and predict defects is something that's not happening you know, as vociferously as we want. It's being spoken about it in theory, but many teams have not really you know, adopted it. Looking at the second part to it, Right, you know, automate everything. That's the magic bullet to all this. You know, you automate everything. We'll execute it any number of times, and that takes care of quality. And then we are very, very good at it. Right. So first of all, um, you know, there are varying levels of maturity. Right. Everybody talks about automate everything. You know, about forty-five percent of the organizations don't get to it. You know, because, you know, everybody thinks that Agile is great. You know, it's about less documentation and we go about, we work on certain user stories, knock them out, go on weekly sprints, you know, release them and go about. But what's happening is with the lack of focus on the quality engineering side, uh, you know, 40% of the effort goes into bug fixes, you know, and then into bad quality releases. There are emergency releases being planned and both eyes are not on the road. You know, there's a lot of distraction and there's prioritization that's there. And then, uh, you know, automate everything is a state of nirvana, you know, which we get to, that's fantastic. But if we don't get to, you know, that's still a problem, right? On top of it, you know, releases um, moving from weeks to days to hours to minutes, right? And depending on the maturity level of different organizations. So you still need to have a strategy, even if you have automated the entire thousand tests, cases that you need to run in a particular sprint, you may not really have the time to do it. And, and a lot of go no go decisions are machine controlled these days. Uh, and, and, and you don't need to wait to run the entire suite if it's something that's absolutely you know time challenging and needs to go in. So what we did is we did an exercise with one of our engagements, right? So we picked up the thousand test cases that we run in every release and we saw what was the defect detection rate, you know, uh, for when you run these test cases? We get the maximum yield of defects until 260 test cases. And then after that, it started to taper down, right? So there are two applications of AI that we looked at in here. So one is, you know, if, uh, you know, there is certain defect tolerance and then, you know, there are critical paths that we're focusing on more, then how do we prioritize the test cases that need to be run first, which will identify 85 to 90% of the defects, you know, much earlier in, you know, in time. And how do we run that first? And second is, you know, if the pattern of, you know, defect detection is as lower than what it needs to be defined thresholds, then there is an early go, no go that you can do. So we didn't, you know, it's just switch uh, and we didn't flip the switch overnight. We we actually benchmarked this for about four months. We looked at the risks for it, and this was something that really helped us. And our you know we were able to accelerate our releases by at about forty five percent. 
So that's something that really works. So the applications of AI and about prioritization of what will you run and correlating it with you know, production, you know, incidents, patterns, customer journey. And not only that, you, know, you also have a lot of access to development related analytics on which developer is checking in their code, what has been the pattern of defects in the past for them, what kind of issues have come. And then you know, you're also able to have agents which can map change in code to the actual test cases that are impacted and you're able to prioritize which of the test cases that you execute and execute first. And that will really you know, help you as you move, both in terms of lower maturity where you're not fully automated to where you're automated and you have ultra thin release cycles where you really, really need to move fast. Now the third part is, you know, quality is QA's responsibility, right? And and, and more of them have realized this, right? So now it's um, no longer uh, KPIs, you know, that make the quality team heroes and make the, uh, the rest of the team, you know, look really bad. It's all collaborative KPIs. And we got to be very, very practical. It takes a village to deliver digital, right? So while testing, is seen fairly as outdated and sometimes non-value adding in certain maturity levels of the customers. Nobody questions the value of quality. You you may run a Ferrari, but if the Ferrari just crashes every single time, it's of no use. So quality and the value of quality is is not questioned, but then the role of a quality engineer is completely changing, right? So when you are creating, you know, automated suites, they're completely complementized today. You know, your performance, your SAS and DAS are also built into acceptance test suites, complementized and made available to the developers. And if they want to, you know, go ahead, promote it, you know, do that there. Second thing is, you know, right from unit testing to, you know, uh, functional, to you know, um, you know, stitching them together for the business users, making them all available as part of the same platform, so that your business users can come and pick on, you know, business flows, and your design engine automatically stitches it, you know, for them. That's something that's really, really helpful. So reusability, and enabling you know the rest of the organization to drive higher quality is the number one expectation out of the quality engineering teams today, right? And also what we're seeing is quality engineering teams are stepping up in multiple ways. There's a financial service organization whose net promoter score was minus 28 and they wanted to go positive in a very big way. And it was a quality engineering team that was picked to drive the NPS initiative because it could be a quarterback. They have access to all of the tech and, and how the business users are seeing it, what are the issues and tying it down to prioritization and executing at various teams, they looked at it. You know, there are use cases where the quality engineering team steps up and says, you know, I'm not here to just automate test cases for execution. I'm going to automate triaging. You know, how can I do defect triage automation, you know, using AI, run spindles. And if it takes about three days to go ahead and do triaging for a very large organization, how can I do it in 42 seconds with 70 to 75% prediction accuracy that will save time. So the automation avatar or the automation catalyst in an organization is this, you know, something that's absolutely important and it doesn't have to be just in, in, in terms of you know build validations to system executions, but automation of day-to-day activities and integrating all of them, you know, for maximum velocity. And they're all measured through release velocity. You know, as a quality engineering team, how can you improve developer velocity? How can we increase a net promoter score? How can we, you know, uh, improve the user experience, right? So that's, that's the focus. And then the last thing is, you know, blaming it on the environment, right? Um, you know, it's all modern applications, completely cloud native. There's some that are hybrid. And, you know, it's no longer about, you know, I'm having user stories, just customer journey, but it is also about disruptions to the system and proactively disrupting the system and seeing how they behave in stress. So Netflix started this concept many years back, the Simeon Army, right? It's a resilience engineering concept of 
order of healing and how would you go about right now at&t also you know build up this resilience engineering studio uh with the help of a few partners and they also and they you know um open source it, right so this is about you know unleashing these you know chaos monkeys in your environment mimicking how if a server suddenly went out black how would your system behave under stress and then you know looking at error handling you know looking at making these available as a studio to the development team so that they can build for performance instead of having the quality engineering team test for performance you know as well as you know the learnings from you know unleashing these monkeys and in you know, testing on these applications you know results in in a certain system behaviors which would be great learning for your support team and they would be prepared if there are any outages or things and as a team you know you have better efficiency you have better quality of systems so tomorrow you can focus more on you know building you know systems rather than fixing systems so that's something that is absolutely very very important right now again you know these are concepts that are being implemented today quite obviously by certain organizations certain organizations of maturity are aspiring to get there but as you know change agents and catalysts you know it's i mean the onus is is on you to actually go ahead and try it be bold and see the results and be you know the catalyst of change for your organization so if you have any questions i'd be very happy to take it and um if you want to email me with certain questions uh you know I'm very happy to answer it to my email addresses in here for your reference we do have some time for questions here folks so if you do have any questions comments for sen please feel free to again share them in the chat post them in the q and a i'm really happy to take some time to talk through anything that might be on your mind right now um and i just want to go back then to something you just said as you were you know in the last few minutes here talking about building systems instead of fixing systems right spending more time building the the products and innovating in those areas rather than fixing and testing um and that's definitely a, a mantra here at sas labs as well um but it's hard to get there right so there needs to be some building of a foundation that is stable and solid that you can then work off of um because fixing is is sometimes absolutely necessary um and just wondering if you have some more thoughts to share on sort of how how teams can make that leap from fixing systems to building and innovating um forward no oh, absolutely so i'll give you um an example of an engagement where we were um, you know promoting release velocity as a kpi versus you know um finding defects right so first is it's, it's a cultural change it's a mindset right so you know i haven't been in automation for over two decades being part of various quality engineering teams and through the transformation journey the tendency is for us to find it because that's what we are in for in in this role so it's, it's a cultural change and and then the first way you would drive that change in culture is the way you measure the teams right that's absolutely important so if there is you know if there are kpis on release velocity and developer velocity and you know finding things earlier in the you know stage then that promotes that culture the second thing is you know when you are um you know uh infusing talent into the team the software development engineers and tests will come in who sit with the developers and and who are able to extend the performance engineering scripts the task and saas scripts earlier in the stage and also you're able to leverage you know concepts like the you know resilience engineering stuff that i spoke about then the developers are actually building to perform rather than waiting for somebody to find issues and then you know fixing it right so that's that's something that has really you know promoted the team's culture uh and and then as and when the uh you know as and when more builds go on time and the quality is great and then you're able to actually experience customer delight that becomes the dna of a company so it's it's it's, it's a change process this is absolutely yeah and and i want to talk a little bit more about 
what you were sharing here, Sen, as it relates to you know, financial services organizations, banking. Um, you know, this is our our audience today, right? I think there are probably some specific examples or use cases that we can maybe spend a little bit of time on. But before we go there, um, we do have a <laughs> comment in the chat here from Willie asking to know more about the chaos monkey. I think your your earlier slide there was a, a big hit. Um, we had the chaos monkey and a chaos gorilla. And I don't know if there's more specifics behind those examples, but. So, um, you know, Willie, really, you can probably email me and we'll, you know, point you to the exact, you know, open source uh, studio, which will help you get access, you know, to, to the chaos monkey, you know, code and how you can implement it. Now, um, there are a lot of companies like Qualitest, who also specialize in this. We have built capabilities around it, wrappers around it, we implement it for different customers. Uh, but you know, if you also go search for the word Simeon Army, that is the concept of Chaos Monkeys. It's very popular. Uh, this came into existence about, I'd say five, six years, very widely implemented about four years back, but it's uh, probably not seeped into some of the organizations. A lot of organizations have made this, uh, you know, uh, a DNA of the company, they call it game day, you know, they do this, uh, you know, uh, once or twice a month, they reroute, uh, you know, 2% of their production traffic into these environments and they unleash the chaos monkeys and they see how the system behaves, how do they support teams react to it, otherwise support teams are seen as insurance. So they really want to see how they're reacting to this and they're really ready for those outages. So there are many concepts around it. It's called game day, it's called Simeon Army, and there are uh, open source uh, libraries that are available to implement and there are partners like us who can also help you implement it. Great, thank you for that. Um... We have a, a couple of responses in the chat um, I, I had posted earlier when you were talking about testing the customer journey versus testing features. Um, and it, it seems like where the audience is at here is um, largely on that feature testing side of things. Um, and certainly spending time with us today in large part because they want to make those shifts and find efficiency and, and better test automation practices. Um, so to the point that I was starting to raise earlier around how might we find implementation for this specifically in um, financial services organizations. Sen, I don't know if you have any best practices to share or perhaps an example of where you've seen this done well within this industry. So the net promoter score example that I spoke about for a financial services organization, in the same example, we had you know done this customer journey mapping, right? So, so what would happen is, someone would say, your app sucks. I can't even log in, right? Or, or they'll say, your app sucks. You know, I'm not able to, you know, go ahead and, you know, modify my account details, right? But the underlying problem for, you know, not being able to modify their, you know, um, you know account details could be is they're not even able to log in or they don't have the, uh, you know, right areas that they could have access to login, right? So how do you really, you know, tally? So, so a lot of that was leading into bad net promoter score. There was not a lot of information, right? And that's how we started, you know, looking at all of these logs. We did this about uh, four, five years back too, right? And then, so what we did is we went and we started to see the user session logs. We started to see, okay, the person was not able to, you know, go ahead and do this, but what had really happened. So there's some other activity that has really happened and the error is being reported out to something else, right? So, but then that's when we realized this is something that if we take and we apply both to the production environments and to the test environments, we can compare the user journey focus that's happening on the production side versus the user journey uh, coverage that we're doing on the testing side. How good is that test coverage? You know, 70% of the traffic is happening in this particular area, but our focus is in this area. So the feature that we are developing, you know, who's going to question if the feature is really right? That's going to be, the, that has to be the quality engineering team. And unless they understand the customer journey and how the end user is using your system, it's a big problem. And today that is one of the biggest problems. You know, a lot of the development and testing teams are submerged into day-to-day -day tactical stuff or dealing with features, dealing with definition of done, 
but they're losing the purpose of why are we developing these features? What is it going to do for the customer? How is the customer using it today and being able to question the feature? Because you know, not always the product you know, managers are right. Uh, and and you know, with the scarce, scarcity in talent, there are a lot of moving teams and this is becoming an issue. So the quality engineering team needs to step up, you know, compare, you know, the, uh, and then there's a lot of access. They just need to speak to their production support teams. They're using a lot of tools. A lot of knowledge is there in terms of events and logs. You know, there could be some from, you know, let's say from a Dynatrace, some from a tea leaf perspective, some from Splunk logs, you know, pull it all in where you can run analytics. If you don't have AI engines, you know, run, you know, analytics on this and you're able to correlate these, you know, insights together and you'll be able to see what are the journeys that are running. So today, you know, some of the specialist modern quality engineering companies like Qualitas, they're running AI uh, and they're doing application of AI in this data. And then, then they're deriving insights dynamically so that we can, you know, feed into a test design, you know, automation engines and update these test cases dynamically. And then, you know, test something that's close to production, right? That's something that's very important. Uh, product testing in production is, is, is a new norm. So if there is zero downtime, you know, when you're deploying, then, you know, just imagine, right? So you have to have a strategy around how would you also product, test in production? That's uh, been an uptake uh, and that's very much applicable to the financial services organizations. In here. Yeah, thank you for that. And definitely it sounds like the, the focus on the customer, right? And that is certainly where, where our focus is at SAUCE. And I think if we're talking about quality and testing at the end of the day, we're, looking to provide that quality so that we have customers who are excited to use the product and engage um, because without without them we we have no product so certainly where our our focus is as well um, we just have about a minute here before we switch to the next session um, but said we just had a, a question come in asking if you could please elaborate on testing in production um, could you just add a brief addition on um, any examples that, that might exist there? So um, I will deviate a bit from financial services so that it's an example that everybody can relate to, right? Um, uh, because I see a mix of uh, you know uh, folks coming in from other industries in here as well. Now, um, if you take a digital inhaler, let's say an asthmatic patient, okay? Um, if you pump, you know, less, still, you know, going to have trouble breathing. If you pump more, you could die. It could hit your brains and you could die, right? So for doctors to, you know, look at, you know, how many times, you know, they're pumping these inhalers, what is the level of medicine that's going in, you know, um, one of the companies digitize the health process in that, right? Now, there is a communication between the IoT device on an inhaler to your mobile phone and interaction with cloud, and then you go about it. So it's a complete lab setup, right? Now, when we need to, and then zero downtime for this, right? So we need to actually go and test in production for different features or automation scripts that we need to run. So we set aside user IDs in production that we related to test and we are very clear on what would we disrupt? How would we clean up the data for what we create? How would it not affect the other area? So there is a boxing uh, strategy around it and what you what would you box in, in terms of you know the areas that you do, what would you test in production versus what you would not? And then you run it continuously. So that, those automated tests run continuously. They're not like you run it once or twice. You run it continuously so that there is some issue in, in terms of system capacity or there is an even that's unexpected and the life cycle of a customer journey for, across these 20 user IDs is disrupted and a functionality is not working. Immediately it alerts the testing team and we could even, you know, let the production uh, support teams know that there is an issue that's happening. You got to be proactive. It's a, you know, you, you know, take care of this or you let the customers know because this is a, you know, a situation of life and death, right? So the same principle applies across all industries. How do you box it, the strategy around it? 
How do you continuously run it? How do you have an alert mechanism? The threshold of how much to do versus how much not to do so that you don't affect the performance of the production system. And again, the security associated with those user IDs and, and, and a complete governance around it and a reporting mechanism. So I'm, I'm just scratching the tip of the iceberg because this is a, this is a, an open call for everybody, but there is a, a very detailed strategy around how would you, you know, do testing production.